Thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, for having me here uh, to talk about uh, some of my research agenda with uh, Moline Sean and my former student, uh, Alexei Kasanov. So if you're in the search for talent, I beg you to, to look at him because he's on their place at this moment. Okay, so uh, it's uh, amazing to be in this conference where I don't need to, to convince the audience that thinking about non-linearities is important. I've been trying to do this for the last 20 years and it's always a an outreach uh, to convince the general macro audience, but here it seems that it's gonna be an easy task for me. Okay, so let me talk about what we do in this project. So we think about dynamic factor models, and you know that uh, this is one of the most useful tools uh, in terms of uh, time series that we have uh, both in academia and in uh, uh, central banking. Uh, the standard dynamic factor model establishes a linear relation between the factor today and the factor yesterday, and the factor and the observation variable. There are twists around that with Markov switching, time varying parameters, but for most of the literature, people have concentrated in this type. But as we have seen in, in the previous presentations, uh, in the last uh, 15 years, we have experienced a lot of these uh, sort of tail events that introduce uh, uh, outliers in the data. So we are forced to rethink our models in terms of how do we handle these uh, nonlinearities. Stochastic volatility is one way that people have uh, used it uh, to, to deal with the COVID uh, scenario, for example. Okay? But on top of this, uh, for example, we have uh, these uh, binding constraints. One example is the zero lower bound. If you think in terms of probabilities, for example, if you have uh, probabilities of moving from uh, employed to unemployed, well, this also imposes bounds into the data. So we need to think about how to use uh, these toolboxes once we have uh, this sort of uh, nonlinearities uh, kicking in around uh, the data. So that's what we do here. So in this model, we are going to introduce, uh, uh, we're going to start at a very abstract way of the relation between the factor and itself in the past, and also between the factor and the data that we observe. So that's how we're going to start. Obviously, this is a very ambitious agenda, so that it goes uh, along the lines of uh, what Maximiliano was doing, they're trying to have a non-parametric approach. So we are more uh, humble in the sense that we are going to try to learn from what people have done in the structural macro literature, and in particular, we are gonna use uh, some results of the solution of uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. In particular, we are gonna use the representation of a second order uh, perturbation approach to these uh, nonlinear models as the baseline for our dynamic uh, factor model. What is interesting is that it's a very simple model, but out of this simple model, for example, we can generate some of the factors that we have seen in the previous presentations. For example, we can generate asymmetric impulse response functions in the sense that a positive shock has a different uh, impact than a negative shock. It's also state dependent. So if you see it in a financial crisis, the same uh, uh, shock will have different implications than if you go to normal times. Uh, the predicted distributions that I'm gonna show you, they, they display non-normalities. Uh, time uh, varying volatility emerges as an endogenous uh, element of the model without introducing a stochastic volatility by itself. And also, I'll, if I have time, I'll talk a bit uh, about uh, the asymmetric tail behavior. We are gonna use uh, two applications that highlight uh, two different flavors of uh, uh, our model. So the first one is going to be a nonlinear credit cycle, where I'm going to show you that as we move to the 2000s and more recently, this nonlinear component of the financial cycle became more important. If you look in the 90s and the 80s, you don't need to, to uh, rely in our infrastructure to think about the data. And the second one is an exercise where we try to extract, as a Wu and here, a shadow rate, where we specifically impose the zero lower bound restriction on the short-term rates. Okay. So that's uh, what we do. And uh, the second uh, exercise, what is going to emphasize or tries to show you is that it's not that hard to do this nonlinear estimation once you impose these, bound and, uh, these uh, bounding constraints that come uh, from, uh, in this case, uh, the zero lower bound. Okay. There is a big literature, but uh, some of you are here. Let me skip and let me go to the, to the model. Okay, so this is how we start. We're gonna postulate that the factor today depends on the factor yesterday via this unknown function h. So that's like the highest level of abstraction that we can put. 
as I come from a macro structural uh, uh, training, then the natural way for me to think about uh, this nonlinear relation is to use this uh, second order approximation uh, between the factor and the factor itself in the past. Okay? Now, if you have worked with this uh, type of approximations, you know that this uh, uh, plain raw approximation to the, this uh, di uh, nonlinear dynamic uh, uh, analysis introduces explosiveness in the model. So then what you do, you are gonna separate uh, two components of the factor. One is gonna be a first order component and a second one is gonna be a second order component where the, these two components evolve, one as the standard linear uh, factor component that uh, you have been using in the past, and the second one is the one that will track uh, the nonlinearity. Notice that here, critical to, to introduce stability of the model is that uh, the factor, the second uh, component, depends on the linear component to the square. If you don't do this uh, trick, then this uh, system is not uh, stable. So this is something that uh, we learned from the work of, uh, among other people, Andreas uh, Fernandez Villaverde and Rubio Ramirez. If you impose uh, this uh, restriction on, uh, on the, uh, on the autoregressive process in our case, then you can show that the factor uh, component has this uh, rich nonlinear structure. So as you can see, you have a volatility on the path, so it's gonna have uh, the time varying volatility that uh, in our case emerges naturally without uh, having uh, to impose. Also, you can see here, because I have uh, this dependence on the H and HX uh, of, of the system, then the shocks will have this asymmetric uh, behavior and also will depend on where you are in the cycle of the economy. Okay. So the first uh, approach uh, to solve or to take uh, this model to the light uh, is uh, to use the nonlinear uh, factor uh, dynamics and impose a linear relation uh, between the factor and the observable. So this is what we are going to do in the uh, financial uh, um, data application. When we have uh, the, the zero lower bound, we are going to switch uh, this linear relation between the factor and the data. Here we are going to have a max operator that is going to be the max between what the factor is predicting what the interest rate should be, and zero. So the moment that we go below zero, then uh, the data has to be uh, uh, bounded at zero, yet we leave uh, the, the, the shadow rate uh, to be informed by the longer maturities. And as you will see in a moment, the longer maturities are quite important to inform what this uh, shadow rate should do uh, during uh, zero lower bound episodes. Okay. We are going to uh, impose normality in the uh, in the innovations to the system. The reason is because, as I show you in the MA, the composition of our system is already quite rich. So we don't want to blur uh, the the richness of the model with uh, additional uh, nonlinearity elements like time varying uh, parameters or uh, stochastic volatility. There is nothing in the approach that uh, uh, keeps you from doing that. Here, for clarity, we keep it this simple. Okay. So the model has a, this very nice uh, state space uh, representation. And from here, if you stare enough uh, for a moment to this uh, representation of the system, you immediately can see some of the nice uh, 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 characteristics of the system. So for example, you will have asymmetric responses to the shocks. Why? Because the system will depend on the square of the, of the shock. So if you have a, a positive shock, the two reinforce the system. But if the shock is negative, well, the, the quadratic term will undo some of the effect of the quadratic term. You can also see that there is the time varying volatility component over here already. And uh, you can see also other nice features about, uh, for example, the dependence of the input response on where the economy is at a particular time because of this dependence of the factor to today on where the factor was yesterday, and this guy is in terms informed by this uh, uh, part of the, the composition. Okay. So let me uh, uh, go through some of the, of the properties of the model when we do uh, uh, numerical uh, uh, analysis of the model. Here we are going to plot uh, generalized impulse uh, response functions. Uh, the left uh, uh, graph is to a positive uh, shock. The right uh, graph is uh, to a negative shock. The blue line is uh, how the factor uh, behaves after these uh, innovations. And then we decompose into the first order element, 
So that's the one that you will get out of a standard dynamic factor model. And the dark line, solid line, is what you get or the contribution of the second order uh, component. And as I mentioned before, you can see that depending on the sign of the, of, of the shock, uh, these two first and second order components reinforce each other, so that's the left-hand side, or they fight each other. So there is uh, some uh, dampening if uh, the shock is uh, negative. Why? Because the quadratic term uh, gives you a positive uh, effect. This is uh, an example that uh, generates uh, that uh, depending on where you are in the cycle. So now I'm going to condition uh, where the economy is. The, the, fact, the linear factor with the blue line is at 0.56. The uh, dotted uh, black line is at 3.33. Uh, we choose just, uh, just uh, as an example, and you can see again the positive shock on the left, the right shock on the right, and you can see this a uh, very nice uh, feature of the model that notice where you are in the cycle can have uh, this uh, endogenous uh, propagation effect where you need only one shock, and then you're going to start getting these humps in the data. So this is, for example, if you think about the European debt crisis, you can think of these spreads that are increasing the, during 2011. Well, they are, in our model, emerging from one shock, and then it's the internal propagation, the one that does uh, the, the job uh, for you. So this is another feature that uh, we think uh, the model, uh, another feature of the model that is uh, quite tractable. Something that uh, people already talked in the previous presentations, we can talk about the shortfall or the long rise of the, of, uh, the predictive density, and the model is going to generate asymmetry behavior in, uh, in, uh, in response to these uh, shocks, as you can see at the bottom of this uh, figure. You can see in our particular, uh, in this particular exercise, is a positive shock that pushes the distribution to the right, increases the, the uncertainty of or the, uh, the, the variance of the distribution, so that means that the, the, the loan rise will increase by more than what happens with the shortfall of uh, the distribution. So let me conclude at this by showing you the predictive densities out of the model. So at time zero, you get the shock. This is a normal distribution because the nonlinearity kicks in with one uh, period. And uh, as you move uh, to the second period, you can see that the predictive density starts uh, to depart uh, from normality. In this particular exercise, there is not much persistence. You can see that by period three, uh, you are getting back uh, to the original uh, uh, pre-shock uh, uh, distribution. Okay, so as I said, uh, uh, how much time do I have? Third. Okay, so as I said, uh, we have uh, two, present, uh, two different applications that highlight uh, two different uh, flavors of uh, the, the model, okay? The applications also highlight uh, some of the technical challenges that I'm pretty sure uh, you all know better than I do when you try to estimate these models. Because of the nonlinearity of the model, the particular uh, type that we choose, uh, these models need to be estimated with a nonlinear uh, filter. Okay? So here we are going to use uh, two different filters to estimate the model. The first model, the credit growth in the US, we are going to use a relatively new uh, filter that is called a GIF sampler with a particle smoother, PIGASA for short. It's uh, very useful in a stochastic volatility models, for example. Uh, this has a, uh, uh, the advantage is that it's uh, relatively efficient in the computational sense that you don't need that many particles to do the estimation. Here, the results you are going to see is with a thousand particles. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, once uh, we, go, we go to the interest rate uh, data, then we, we are going to impose this max operator on uh, the relation between uh, the factor and uh, the observables. Okay? For that one, we are going to use Metropolis Hastings uh, with a standard particle filter. Uh, the advantage of this is that it's a standard bootstrap filter, so it's very well known. There are theoretical results uh, about the convergence of, of uh, in this case, uh, uh, to the posterior distribution of our uh, model. Uh, the disadvantage is that it needs a lot of particles. So here, in this particular exercise, because of the nonlinearity introduced by the max operator, we are talking of uh, the order of uh, 10 to the power of five uh, particles. So it's extremely expensive. So here we have uh, this uh, trade-off into capturing these higher nonlinearities, needing uh, this uh, uh, particle uh, filter that is a uh, standard one, 
but it needs to implement it in a lower level language because it's, uh, it's quite computational demanding versus this other approach that is more, uh, uh, is a simpler, easier to implement. For example, this one we implemented with a pretty good results in MATLAB. So let me talk in the, in the I mean, uh, reminding, let me talk about the applications. So let me go to the non-linear credit cycle. Okay, so we are going to take uh, data from uh, the U.S. financial data coming from uh, credit growth, to be more precise, coming uh, from different sectors in the U.S. economy. This uh, picture uh, plots uh, these uh, dynamics, uh, the dynamics of these different uh, credit growth variables, and you can see that uh, it's typically around the crisis, COVID. Uh, the Great uh, Recession and previous recessions where we see these uh, reversals in credit growth that have uh, these uh, high nonlinearities in the data. Okay, so we estimate the model and uh, what you have here in the top uh, panel, we have uh, the nonlinear uh, factor model that's in, uh, in red and in blue is the linear component of the factor model. The second figure down here is the second order element of uh, our factor analysis. And what you can see before the 1990s, or even going into before the, the, the uh, uh, IT boom, you can see that, that there was no need for the nonlinear component. It's everything about uh, uh, the linear uh, factor model. And uh, that explains a bit uh, why when we started this nonlinear business with uh, my co-authors, uh, Juan and Jesus, we had a very hard time convincing people because in reality, you don't need it, uh, a rich uh, nonlinear uh, uh, model to explain what we use in the data. However, as you move to the uh, 2000s and especially around the financial crisis, you can see that uh, the, the second component of the factor model becomes uh, statistically significant and becomes important. Okay. So here you, uh, we illustrate again the, the properties of the model. So for example, we have the impact of a positive shock and a negative shock when you are in a credit boom. So there isn't much happening here. You can see what the nonlinear model predicts relative to a linear model is uh, pretty much the same. But as we move uh, to a credit crunch, Okay, so th this is around uh, 2008. Then what you can see is that the linear model predicts uh, something different to what is going to happen in terms of uh, credit growth. So you have, for example, here an adverse shock is going to make credit growth contract by quite a lot compared to what a linear model is going to predict. And notice this uh, hump that you have uh, here is an endogenous element of the model. You don't need a sequence of shocks to give you the hump. It's just one shock at time zero, and then the model internally will tell you uh, the, this is what is happening. We think that this is important from a policy point of view because if it's just a one shock rather than a sequence of shocks, we think that that's a different uh, action that the central bank should uh, take uh, because it's internally the economy that is, uh, is doing uh, this, uh, this uh, hump uh, rather than a sequence of uh, adverse shocks. So again, this uh, is uh, showing you that the model can generate uh, an endogenous uh, um, stochastic volatility and also this asymmetric behavior of the tails of the predicted distribution. So in the last five minutes, let me talk about the, the second exercise. So here we are going to take uh, interest rates of different maturities, and the task is to extract uh, uh, a shadow rate, so an, indic an indication of where uh, the, the real interest rate of the economy is in the case that uh, we do not impose uh, the zero lower bound as uh, what happened in the U.S. Okay. So we are going to build uh, uh, forward rates uh, using the methodology of uh, Wu and Sia. L let me skip uh, the details. We can talk uh, later. Uh, we are going to have uh, the second order uh, uh, time varying um, uh, factor structure that I mentioned uh, before. On top of this, although you don't see here uh, because of this particular implementation, on the background, this restriction is imposed in a zero lower bound. So if uh, the, the factor is telling you that the, the three-month uh, forward rate has to be uh, below 0.3%, uh, uh, then we cap it at that uh, level. Okay? So now this application, what is going to highlight is the importance of uh, this uh, uh, max operator that you have in the model. You are going to see that in terms at least of this uh, um, uh, interest rate application, this second order component over here is less important. 
we, you can get away with, uh, without this guy. You impose the max operator and you're gonna get a very similar result. So that's why we think uh, we like uh, this other application because highlights that uh, there is no one model fits all sizes. Yep. So here you have a uh, de factor uh, uh, from uh, our nonlinear uh, decomposition. You can see that before the, the, the Great uh, Recession, the, the nonlinear factor model and the linear factor model predicts uh, something very similar, which is not surprising given that uh, there was no uh, any important linearity and nonlinearities in the interest rates. But as we get into the, the zero lower bound, so this is the, the gray shaded line, you can see that the, the linear model cannot uh, capture that because uh, it's, uh, it's not aware that there is a zero lower bound. However, here, because we have uh, the zero lower bound and we let uh, the, the long rates inform how the, the factor has to behave, you can see we have uh, important uh, dynamics. It's easier to see the results uh, with this uh, uh, last uh, picture. So here we have uh, uh, the zero, uh, we have uh, the shadow rate uh, in uh, blue dotted. This is the one from the model by Wu and Xi. The, the red uh, dotted line is what you get out of our model. And uh, this uh, uh, other line that is cap at zero, this is uh, the three month uh, interest rate uh, uh, for the US. And as you can see, the model is quite uh, parsimonious, yet uh, we are getting very close to the shadow rate uh, that uh, we get uh, from Wu and Xia without uh, having to impose all the uh, restrictions they have to impose uh, to uh, make uh, possible the, the estimation of uh, their model. Importantly, if you look at the bottom of, uh, of this uh, figure, when you look at the 10 year rate, you can see in this uh, zoom here, you can see that the dynamics of the factor when you are at the zero lower bound is informed by the longer term rates. Okay? And again, this is uh, possible because we are respecting the, the zero lower bound, yet the factor is still loading on uh, the 10 year rate because the 10 or even uh, the, the five year rate, they are not uh, at the zero lower bound. So they have dynamics that are rich to inform uh, how this uh, shadow rate uh, has to behave. Okay. And uh, we did a, a likelihood ratio test, and we find uh, that the, the nonlinear component of the factor structure is not necessary for this one. But the max operator to cap at the interest rate at zero, that is what's critical in this uh, representation. Okay. So the, to conclude, uh, we propose, uh, uh, um, we, can, we want to think a, a class of uh, nonlinear uh, dynamic factor models. Uh, we hope uh, that uh, the, the applications show you the richness and uh, the flexibility of, of uh, this approach, and um, that the model has uh, this uh, nice asymmetric behavior, state dependence of the impulse responses, and uh, asymmetric state behavior that we have seen in previous applications, in previous papers that we think uh, should be part of our toolbox uh, to do forecasting and uh, more structural analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. So the discussant is uh, Matteo Jacopini. Okay, okay. Thank you. So first of all, uh, it was a really pleasure for me to, to read this paper and to have the chance now, right now to, to discuss it. So I have a little disclaimer. So the author was so cool that uh, many of the things that I have been discussing and willing to ask him, he already answered. So my discussion will be quite shorter, but I'll try to, to, to add something on, uh, on top of that. So, uh, okay, just first of all, to, to recap a little bit what uh, uh, he has been talking about, uh, we have been looking at a new, uh, I mean, a proposal for a new nonlinear uh, dynamic factor model casted in a state space form where the key feature is that both the measurement equation and the state equation are allowed to be nonlinear functions. So this, is, uh, this was mm, constructed to allow for specific features uh, for the impulse response functions on the uh, latent factor. So this was designed to allow for asymmetric replies to positive and negative shocks, uh, state dependence, and uh, size dependence, so to allow for different kinds of asymmetry in many different conceptions of asymmetry itself. 
also the key two key applications that we have uh, we have seen are uh, to us data for the recovery of the shadow uh, rate during the uh, lower bound of the um, of the interest rate period and to the credit cycle okay so once again the key point uh, of all this is, uh, in my view, the specification of this very nice nonlinear dynamics, which can happen both and separately, as we have seen in the two different applications, on the measurement and slash or on the state transition. So let's go very quickly through some of my uh, of my comments. So these are, as mentioned, some comments are just uh, not really useful right now because he already answered them. But one of the key features that I suggest, uh, I suggest the author to, to answer at least within the paper is to, um, to be really, really specific on what they are doing as much as they, he uh, was right during the talk. Uh, because I do believe that this paper is really, really cool and the things they are doing are very nice, but sometimes are a little bit overshadowed in the, in the paper. So I think you should uh, stress them more because you do have a lot of things which are very, very cool here. So in my view, uh, uh, just once again, uh, this double non-linearity, which is not mandatory, you can just turn it on and off according to your application, as you was mentioning uh, over the last few slides you presented, is really, really nice. And uh, I have a comment on this, uh, on this later on, so I'm not spending too much time uh, right now. But uh, one of the, th of the key things I would say to suggest is to highlight a little bit more the difference and the similarities of your specific framework with respect to the two key papers that you were mentioning, so the Kim and the Anderson paper. You have some of this discussion during your talk. I suggest you to spend some more time on that just to avoid, uh, uh, I mean, giving the not clarity about what is new from you and what is just coming from them. So you're mentioning this uh, pruned approximation of the state space using a second order approximation, which is really nice. But my point is, is this approximation something which comes directly from them? Or it is an approximation that you apply to one model of yours? So how does the equations that you have in your model relate to the contribution of these two previous papers? So what's the difference in here? And uh, in terms of uh, the specification of the model, so in the most general form, uh, as it is, let's say, for generic uh, um, G and H functions, which represent the measurement and uh, uh, the C-transition equations. So um, they are allowed to be generic nonlinear functions. But I guess that if you provide some more uh, intuition about the specific kind of nonlinearities that you can take or that you can deal with, it's going to be a little bit more, uh, I mean, nicer and clearer. Yeah, on this side, you are using, in one application, a max function to allow for this uh, lower bound, which is a particular case. But did you try to use alternative forms of nonlinearity in the measurement equation just to have an idea in a simulation setting about the performance of your method? So this is an open question. Uh, other point that I do have is that uh, uh, in your um, your generic framework, so Y stands for uh, your observables, F is your factor. So what's the size of these two guys? So in the real data applications, F is fixed to one. So you have one factor, which is the shadow interest rate. It is the common uh, driver of the credit growth cycle. But in practice, for your theoretical framework, do you restrict them to be exactly a scalar for FT, or it is allowed to be Greater, and I have a further comment on this in the next uh, in the next slide. So going forward, uh, this is a little bit where uh, I have a little bit more of of questions. So you propose two different algorithms for the estimation uh, of your meters. Uh, you have a nice slide in your presentation uh, highlighting the particle Gibbs and the metropolis Hastings with uh, the particle bootstrap filter. So my question here is uh, a very simple one at first, at least to ask, is why do you have two of them? So you are, you are, we're mentioning that it, the computational cost of the two is different. One is an approximate, the other is not. Uh, and you were referring also to the different number of particles, which is also one of the questions that I had at the beginning. Uh, so my point is, did you test both of them on the same DGP 
in a simulation study to highlight was it criticality of one compared to the other one? If so, what are the problems of one compared to the other? One is approximate, okay, but uh, what is the, I mean, the loss of information that you are having in just going for the quickest solution? And uh, a second, another question which is not listed in here is that since you're using, at the end of the day, some particle booster filter, for example, uh, my question is, okay, this, by design, this kind of class of algorithms is quite wide and allows for whatever kind of state space model. So without relying necessarily on a uh, very simple or very complex uh, measurement slash transition equation. So maybe you can leverage, uh, since you are just already using a bootstrap filter, but you can leverage on that to allow for more complex model eventually. Since your, your inference approach basically doesn't care about that much of simplifications as it is right now. Uh, and then some technical details in here uh, about uh, the design of your method. Of, I mean, this maybe is a little bit more tedious for, for the audience to go through it. We can, we can discuss this later. Uh, my main question in here is, uh, why do you need uh, such a long MCMC with a lot of, uh, I mean, a very long burning and thinning. So my guess is that you have a lot of autocorrelation inside, but my question is, since there is not just a single parameter, where is, what is the main source of autocorrelation? Is it for a single parameter or it is for couples of parameters? And if so, which one of them? So this is uh, an additional question. Um, yeah, and one point, very, important one that I skipped before is this parameter HXX which is a, a very I mean I really loved this approach for essentially for this guy because this guy is a scalar parameter uh, which is essentially telling you whether your state transition is linear or nonlinear. In a sense if this guy goes to zero you are back to a linear case so it's beautiful because you are constructing a, non, a potentially nonlinear state transition as a one-to-one -one extension of a linear case. But if this guy, my question is, why don't you try to leverage on the Bayesian framework to allow for shrinkage priors on this guy, try to you know, learn from data, so to shrink to the linear case, which is the simplest one, the most intuitive one if you want, so the one that, as you mentioned, the guys are prone to accept in the narrative, and deviate from it if the data tells you to do that. So right now you have a kind of a standard Gaussian prior for this, uh, with a slightly higher variance, but if, I think that you can leverage, since also it is a scalar, you don't have that much of a burden in a computational aspect to learn from it. And it's gonna be kind of data-driven learning of the non-linearities of the state, uh, if it is necessary. Uh, and this is kind of one of my main questions. So, going multivariate, I'm done. Going multivariate in terms of the factors, so from one factor to more than one factor. Is it feasible in terms of, let's say, theoretically speaking, for the model uh, design? And if so, computationally speaking, do you envisage any particular trouble in doing that? And if so, which one of them? And then uh, just going quickly, because I'm running out of time. Uh, so, yes. Uh, for the grid cycle, uh, I mean, for the grid cycle application, uh, sometimes, at least in the, in the current version that I have read, uh, I struggle a little bit in understanding uh, among the different and competing models that you have, which one is the best. So I have a really, I mean, it's really clear from um, the picture and the narratives uh, that your model, what it is doing. Sometimes I struggle to find, uh, let's say, a, a very practical uh, question, okay, so should I go for model A or model B? Uh, um, let's say a more objective way than just uh, looking at pictures. This, there is something like this in uh, the other application that you have for the uh, shadow interest rate when you have some marginal likelihood computation. And maybe is there something that you can do also in this case or it is done but I just uh, was unable to find it in the paper. And finally, for the marginal likelihood computation, you were using this kind of harmonic mean estimator do you find any numerical issue in working with that kind of estimator? Because sometimes 
I mean, it's not that easy to work uh, to work with that. So I was wondering whether there was any kind of numerical trouble there. And then, I mean, there are other just minor I can ask uh, maybe later just to let the, the other audience talk. Uh, by the way, it was really, really nice. I enjoyed uh, revising and uh, thanks a lot for your presentation once again. So let's speak a few questions from the audience as well. Thank you, and this was a great paper and great discussion. And I wanted to follow up on probably some of the comment, one comment of Jacopo, and it's about uh, the relationship with the, the um, with DSG model. So in, you use the word inspired in your slides, and so and can we think or can you establish like a mapping between um, a DSG model solved at the second order, and and so then. What can we learn relatively to, to that? Like, it will be interesting because one of the issues you know, we are having in our stochastic volatility framework might be a not a, as direct connection uh, with the DSG. So in terms of using those models for validating or finding statistical moments or property that then I can look back in my DSG, uh, it's not that at least immediate. So I was wondering whether that could be a strength of your approach. Hi, so I had some questions on your applications. So on the first application, I was wondering, um, like, you know, um, whether you looked a bit like at the coefficient. So in particular, for example, whether the coefficient on the quadratic term is positive or negative. And like, you know, in general to compare like the linear shape and the, like, you know, your um, non-linear shape and whether you could come up with an interpretation of this result in terms of like, you know, some economic story. And the second question is like, so normally if you look at those shadow rates, right, they would be different from the actual rates if you're at uh, like, you know, at zero lower bound, right? And in your case, they seem to differ also like, you know, over entire history. So I was wondering um, what was the story behind this? Pablo, um, so I think it's a very nice paper and I, I, I will I have a very technical question. You didn't mention the underlying variables that you are using in the credit model and the and the interest rate model. I think in the interest rate you talk about different interest rate, but in the credit model, I would like to know which are the, the underlying variables that you didn't, at least I didn't see in the presentation. And then um, also with respect to this approximation to the dynam I mean, to the DSG, something that I also, we like some clarification to talk about the second order approximation, but uh, basically, do you try other, like third order will give you different things, or um, I don't know, or if the second order is not important enough, perhaps you don't need another one, because uh, perhaps uh, could give you more room in terms of like positive and negative shocks than, than just considering a second order, and perhaps delete the second order and use the third order, I don't know. That's something that I would like to know. Uh, thank you, very nice presentation. Uh, I liked a lot the application to interest rates, which is quite important given the period of the zero lower bound and the result, the likelihood ratio test is quite um, reassuring for all the literature. Um, I was just wondering about the linear model. So it, how was this factor identified to become flat? Because like if you're just using all the forward rates, it should kind of if it's not restricted to follow like the federal funds rate, it should be kind of average, right? So I was wondering how this was identified. So Pablo. Okay, so thank you, Matteo, for the uh, amazing presentation. I have to apologize with you because I, I, we sent you the older version where a lot of these points are already addressed. So um, I apologize for that. Some of the questions that you ask about, uh, they, we push them to the appendix. So I think we will have to bring them back to the to the main text uh, to to clarify them. Okay. So going back to uh, the, the the question on uh, what variables we use. So we use uh, credit growth for the different sectors in the U.S. economy. So that yeah, so we use uh, five uh, variables of credit growth going to different sectors of the U.S. economy. Now, a, a common question that came uh, both uh, by Matteo, Dario, and other uh, people in the audience is the relation between our model and a structural DSG model. So that's a, a, an excellent question. Uh, you can think uh, 
you, you get our representations. Think about the HXX that we have in a model. This is the second order. This uh, will be a convolution of, uh, for example, if you have a stochastic volatility in your model, or if you have a quadratic adjustment in investment. So this, this HHX is going to be a convolution of that. So it's kind of semi-structural analysis, but we cannot go deeper to what you can do from the DSG literature. We think it's a very useful approach once we have these nonlinear DSGs, because people, what have done is to have a, a linear VR where we have some form of uh, uh, nonlinearity, like a condition in, where you are in the business cycle, and then you get an input response, and then you try to match it. Uh, for me, there is no theoretical analysis that says that, that should, uh, the, the empirical input response should match the theoretical input response. I think uh, we think. Uh, uh, our uh, uh, formulation is a step of trying to bring uh, these non-linearities from a reduced form uh, model to discipline what uh, the structural uh, fully uh, non-linear uh, macro models that we have. So that's the way we want to, to think about. Uh, going, uh, uh, another question is about uh, the estimation of, uh, of this uh, HH parameter. So here we need a lot of particles or we need these very long chains because if you look at the MA representation of what we have, this HXX term introduces this endogenous time volatility in the model. So this guy then starts to fight with the variances that we have for the measurement error or the variance of the linear component of the factor analysis. So it took us a while to, to figure out that once we let uh, we 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 got a nice convergence, it was clear that we need the long chain because uh, this uh, HX was uh, having some identification issues uh, with uh, one of the variances of of the of the model. So that's uh, one reason why we need uh, these uh, very long uh, MC MC chains. Okay, so. About uh, the second and third uh, uh, approximation, well, if you have worked with the structural models uh, and you know that uh, the second order is already a stretch because it's a Taylor expansion, so if you go to the third order approximation, this is going to be even uh, tighter, so it's going to be even less relevant uh, than the second order. Uh, related to this uh, point, uh, uh, we did uh, try to do some uh, thinking about uh, 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 a model with more than one factor. Uh, we do we do two things, and again, we apologize, this is in the appendix. The first one is uh, we did just a plain uh, PCA, and we extracted uh, two, the, the two first uh, principal uh, components, and we find uh, that uh, they line up uh, with what is our first uh, uh, component and the second component. It's, they have a strong uh, uh, correlation between them. Okay? So for that reason, we didn't uh, push much uh, going uh, to, to a second factor model because I guess one application that we thought at some point is to have both macro and financial data in the, in the system, so then you can think that they have a different factors uh, structures, so that's a potential application. But again, it's, uh, it's uh, pushing the computational limits of uh, what we can do. But, yeah. So that's, I'm hoping that I answer most of the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mateo, and thank you for the questions.